Hello, I'm Ronald Day, Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy, and welcome to Both Sides of the Bars, a discussion-driven show that examines the criminal justice mm -hmm. system from various perspectives, including from those most impacted by the system. We discuss critical questions about how the current system works, its intersections with social justice, and highlight the efforts that are being made to improve the lives of everyone that is affected by it. We ask you, the viewer, to spread the word about both sides of the bars and to share your comments with us on Twitter at The Fortune Society. Today, we're going to be talking about a really important issue, the unique needs of veterans that have criminal justice system involvement. And I have two great guests with me today, Sarah. Harris, who works right now for Jericho Project. I'm going to read a little bit about your bio. Uh, so Sarah has an MSW. She's been working with the veterans population for about five years. And for the past two years, she's been working as a senior social worker, a post-traumatic stress specialist at Jericho's Project's Kingsbridge Terrace Veterans Residence, mm. a supportive housing residence for chronically homeless veterans with histories of mental illness and substance use disorders. She is certified as a mental health first aid and is trained in prolonged exposure therapy, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, trauma-informed care, the sanctuary model, seeking safety, and more. So thank you, Sarah, for being with us thank on both sides of the bars. And I have also Mr. Lynn McCray, who <coughs> is a phenomenal individual who has been working with veterans for an extensive amount of time, mm -hmm. and I'll allow you to elaborate on that when you mm -hmm. when we turn turn okay. it over to you. Thanks so for the So why don't back. we start? No, it's it's a pleasure to have both of you on both sides of the bars. So why don't we start by just giving a little background on the issue of unique needs of veterans with criminal justice system involvement? We know that this is a is an important issue in our community. The city council recently called for a hearing to study the unique needs that veterans have we i mean there are thousands of people right who are now entangled in the criminal justice system who are veterans what we discovered during some of the focus groups with veterans is that many of them don't disclose that they are veterans and some of it had to do with even how you refer to them if you refer to them as a veteran they might have a other than honorable discharge they might consi not consider themselves veterans so all of these were challenges they might they think that they might lose their benefits and so again it can we're trying to reach this particular population and close some of the gaps that exist between service providers and like agencies that work exclusively with veterans. So won't you tell us, Sarah, since you work exclusively with veterans, about some of the, uh, just some of the background issues in working with that population? Yeah, sure. um, so I think one of the things that we find when working with veterans that have been involved in some capacity in the criminal justice system is that we have individuals that nine times out of 10 are getting involved because of the fact that they have some sort of history of trauma. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it be that they're self-medicating and turning to drugs or alcohol, or it's you know untreated symptoms like um, hypervigilance or or flashbacks or dissociative episodes, things like that, um, you might find that somebody is going to get themselves involved in in scenarios that might land them in the justice system. Um, unfortunately, then what happens from there when you have somebody with undiagnosed PTSD that then uh, it becomes incarcerated, we find that the symptoms are just exacerbated in a situation yeah. like that. Um, you know, there's not as much support, it's not really a trauma-informed environment, and when you take somebody that's been exposed to trauma before and is, you know, leans towards those kinds of symptoms, um, they're more likely to develop complex trauma from there if they're continuously exposed to more trauma, so. Got it. And I'd like to hear a little bit more later about you know how many veterans I'm mean, not like a specific statistic but like a lot of veterans are dealing with PTSD and then what are some of the challenges that compound that for them mm -hmm. so but Lynn so yes. you are a veteran yes and Vietnam also a veteran, veteran Vietnam era right and you also a veteran who has served some time in the criminal justice system yes. 27 years 27 years yes. Wow so can you tell us about your experience and then you've worked with veterans as well for a number yes. of years. I have worked for um, 
Well, in different scenarios. Yes. While incarcerated, I helped founded and operated a, a program called the Veteran Self-Help Project right. where I became in depthly knowledgeable about the different issues with veterans. Up until that point, I was just going on my own experience. I didn't really have a lot of experience with the, the deep issues. Yes. For example, the uh, PTSD wasn't even known at that time since 1984. It was yeah. still being litigated. Right. And the Vietnam era veterans who or Vietnam in-country veterans, when the time they went in and the way it went was this. Prior to Vietnam, the units went in as one whole unit. Yeah. During World War II, Korean War, mm -hmm. and so forth. So the whole unit was intact. In Vietnam, it was different. First of all, it was a totally integrated war. It was no mm -hmm. longer black vests, white vests. Mm -hmm. You know, it was sure. totally legally integrated. Yes. That was a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. The second one was the fact that in Vietnam era, you went in as an individual. So someone like myself would come off the streets say 42nd Street, 2009, and go right into a combat situation, mm. 2009 in, in Vietnam. Yeah. 2010, on that same date, you back in 42nd Street. No debriefing, no anything, you yeah. just back. So now all the, the stuff that you did and used to survive, you know, now it's back, it's, it's embedded in you. Sure. So now as soon as somebody comes and kicks off on that, you do what you're trained to do. Mm -hmm. So they end up going in the system much longer with much serious crimes. Wow. Yeah. And so I want to hear a little bit more about that. But I want to turn back to Sarah now, because you mentioned that uh, that many of the veterans are coming home with PTSD in a way as a way to cope. They might be self-medicating mm -hmm. and many, some of them are homeless. Mm -hmm. And so what is it that can be done to address those specific issues, the PTSD? I mean, what is it that we can do as a country to deal with those issues? For starters, I mean, I think a more comprehensive, uh, what they would call like a decruitment process, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when an individual's um, coming back from a deployment or, or even just being discharged from the military, um, I, from what I understand as a civilian, the way it is now um, is that there, you know, there's, there is a short period, but they're sort of, um, from whether it be word of mouth or, or whatnot, they understand that the process is, will be a lot longer yeah. if you demonstrate symptoms of PTSD and, and that they'll send you to more treatment, where at that point, most of the people that are coming home just want to go home to their families. So they're more than likely going to uh, deny symptoms or they're going to know, you know what to say in order to, to not have to prolong their stay. Um, and so I think that's for sure you know, some, uh, a place to start. Um, and then just, you know, opening up the dialogue, you know, I mean, I think that it still exists, even though PTSD has been a thing for, for, you know, a solid chunk of time at this mm -hmm. point, it, it's still not as openly discussed and it's still not as openly okay for mm -hmm. a veteran of the military to say, I need help mm -hmm. and to say mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm suffering some, with some of these symptoms, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and it's interesting because we did a film screening of a movie called War Crimes, mm -hmm. and that was an issue. Some of the yeah. veterans that had been charged with offenses, they didn't necessarily, the courts, I mean, their attorneys didn't want them to reveal at times that they suffered from PTSD right. because they felt that that might increase the likelihood that they would be convicted of right. crimes right. and so forth. And I think part of that reasoning is the fact that PTSD, as long as it's been established, is still greatly misunderstood. Right. You know, I mean, I've gotten jobs for veterans, and as soon as the, the employers find out that they have PTSD, then they want to call me back up, yo, I want no more from the doctor, this guy going to go violent on me, is he going to do this, he going to do that, and they might have a mild case of PTSD. Exactly. It may not be as severe, you know what I'm saying, so it's, it's greatly misunderstood. Yeah, so that you know? means that we need to educate the, the public about different levels of, I mean, because even when you think about mental illness, you think the most exaggerated right, form of mental right, illness. Right. There's mild depression and so forth, mild absolutely. cases of PTSD. Mm -hmm. So you being a PTSD you know, expert, I mean, and having individuals with criminal justice involvement now looking for jobs, as Lynn right. said, and looking for housing and looking for vocational and educational right. opportunity, how, how is that, how is it, how is this impacted? 
Well, I think that's a beautiful thing about the veterans treatment courts, which are becoming, you know, more prevalent. Um, yes. I think we're there are upwards of 40 of them within the country now, and they only were the first one was started in 2008 in Buffalo. Buffalo, yeah. So, you know, I think the the existence of veterans treatment courts, a court that you know understands that this individual did something wrong and that there's you know they need to to do what they need to do in order to mm -hmm. to serve for that there's they don't incarceration isn't necessarily the best next step and yeah. and especially in the case with veterans it is it's more than likely not the best next step mm -hmm. yeah. um, so those these courts focus more on uh, rehabilitation um, mm -hmm. and alternatives to incarceration whether it be substance abuse treatment vocational training and the court itself actually keeps up with these individuals as opposed to you know being locked up and monitored that way and in a way that's stark different than the traditional courts do, exactly yeah, exactly okay. and they just have a better understanding of what these guys are going through it's you know they're able to be more empathetic in that sense yeah. and Lynn so you have some personal experience as a veteran I remember you in the past talking about the struggle that you had securing employment right, and in housing. Right, right. What about the housing? Because that was something that was very challenging. Yeah, housing for the, uh, for the veteran now, for one thing is they do have a lot of housing now. They have a lot okay. of single room occupancy going on. Most of it is not for intact families. They have some situations where you can't get um, intact family housing through hut bash. You know, but one of the things I would like to have elaborated on a little bit more mm -hmm. was about what's the next step. Yes. I think the VA, for, for example, has started the next step. And they have started hiring veterans, maybe who don't have the credentialing that you have, you know what I'm saying, to work with people with your credentialing. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of veterans or formerly incarcerated people, mm -hmm. they won't come and speak to you as openly as they would me because they know, well, I understand where they're coming from. Yeah. You know, and they kind of, well, know, like you said, they, gotta, they know that they got to say certain things to you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to make things work better for them. Sure. With me, they might kick it straight up. But I should have the ability, or the veteran, whoever gets in that position, should have the ability to know and inform them that, look, I'm going to be talking with the counselor, so, but I'm informing them this words. You got to be truthful. That's right. You know what I'm saying? You're not going to tell them anything that's going to hurt them, but you're going to make them understand. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they'll be more open. So <laughs> what I'm saying is I believe that you need to have more, I guess the best term to call it would be health tech, peer specialist, or whatever, mm -hmm. to work along with the clinicians. That's right. Yeah, and I know that the veteran courts does that. They have yes. mentors that work directly with the veterans, yeah. so that is important. Because and they have they got formerly yeah. incarcerated men and women coming up, going into the courts. That's great. Right now. That's great. And we're going to call it VJO, VJO. Veterans VJO. Outreach, Justice, yeah. uh, Justice Outreach. Yeah. And what about this issue you talked earlier, Sarah, about being trauma informed? Mm -hmm. And we know that. We need more agencies, more community-based organizations, veteran courts, and others to be more trauma-informed. Because if someone goes into the military, there's some trauma that the person could experience, particularly if yeah. it was during wartime. Yeah. A lot of Iraq, a lot of Afghanistan veterans are mm -hmm. in the communities now. And, and, and again, they're looking for opportunities. Mm -hmm. The trauma could be compounded by incarceration, of right. course. Yes. So what about that? I mean, there's this idea that hurt people hurt people, so. Right, right. Well, and I think, you know, something that needs to be understood is that there's not really a threshold for PTSD. So yeah. if you have somebody that's, that was exposed to some sort of trauma, whether it be combat or otherwise, because a lot of the times the people that aren't deployed people then just assume, oh, that means you're not, you don't have PTSD, right. and that's not the case. They may have had childhood trauma or, or uh, you know, the homelessness, like you mentioned, is, is traumatic. Yeah. Um, and you have somebody that, that's starting off with that. And then you put them in an environment like jail or prison, which is known for not being, you know, there's not a lot of lovey-dovey stuff that goes on there. It's, it's, there's, it's a lot of uh, yelling, screaming, loud noises, mm -hmm. fights, and, and, and just strict discipline over compassion. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, that's a big piece that's missing, and there's just a lack of understanding, right? Like, so if you slam a door and an individual that has a history of combat trauma goes into a rage, I mean, that doesn't mean that they're just acting out. It's actually a psychological response. And simple things like that, that I think that aren't as, the, that knowledge isn't as widely, you know, understood and, and thus people aren't, you know, able to be accommodating in that sense. Employers as well, colleges and universities as well, you know, there's not an understanding. They see little behaviors Yes. Most of the time, they're good at covering it up, right? Sure. They have little ticks or whatever that you might not notice, and you might just think, oh, why are they leaving my classroom for 15 minutes mm -hmm. or whatever it might be? But 
um, you know, there's usually more to the story than yeah. that. So that's great. Yeah. And and one thing, Lynn, we found out is that again, some of the veterans that are coming for services are not disclosing that they are veterans. Right. And a part of it had to do with on our like intake form, we ask, are you a veteran? And we, after having conversations with them, it's like, well, do you have military experiences? What, because of they, however they were discharged could matter. So what, what have they told you is the best way for, for us to, to find out if they're veterans, veterans yes. and also to alert them to services that are available right. for them? Because there's, there's two different elements to that. First of all, once a person swears into the military, at that point, he's a veteran. Yeah. Now, whether he's eligible for benefits or eligible for services is a whole nother concept. And, and there are a lot of veterans who are vets, and when you ask them, are they veterans, or say for you come into a group and you're looking to pick up some people from, mm -hmm. you know, from veterans, you say, are there any veterans in the house? You have actually have veterans who don't serve 10, 12, 15 years in the military, but because they wasn't deployed, they didn't go to no combat, they don't think of themselves as veterans. Got it. You know, so when you come and ask the question, you know, when, when I was working for the VA, when I went to a group, I asked them, I explained to them what the, what the, what the reasoning was, mm -hmm. and they said, well, try it your way. Say, how many people here have been in the service? You see a lot more hands go up. Mm -hmm. And then they'll come to you. Then you, then you determine the eligibility level. Mm -hmm. You know, because like I said, people with dishonorable discharges, you can't get any services from the VA. That's just not going to happen. But they are not-for-profit groups, like your group, your group, and other people groups that, other groups that are available. They don't care what your, what, your, what your background is as far as military. You can still get services. You know, but as long as they think trying to get stuff for the VA, it's not going to happen until they get upgrades. Yeah. So the discharge status doesn't matter for the community-based organizations, right. but it matters for the it VA definitely matters with for the respect VA. to benefits. Yes. Okay, well, not down. necessarily benefits. There's two different things. Mm -hmm. but first of all, the VA is constructed of three different organizations. Yeah. VHA, the Veteran Health Administration, that's the hospitals. Then you got the VBA, which mm -hmm. is the Veteran Benefit Association. That's where the benefits come from. And then you got the, uh, the cemetery. So, yeah, with respect to, again, some of the challenges that, that they're facing as they re-enter the community, because we know, you know we have over 2 million people that are incarcerated in our system. We, I don't think we know how many of them are veterans, mm -hmm. and we have 10 million or so that are cycling in and out of our jails. Yeah. We know, a, a, as you said, a decent percentage of them have, been, have military experience. How do we better connect with them? What are some suggestions that Jericho... Um, you know, thinks advisable. I think you hit the nail on the head with just just the simple rephrasing is yeah. really important. You know, just saying instead of saying, "Are you a veteran?" saying, uh, "Do you have experience serving in the military, National Guard, mm -hmm. or reserves?" Mm -hmm. um, because again, there are, then there are also individuals that might think, "Well, I just only I was a reservist. I, that doesn't you know I don't qualify either," and that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. you know, and and I once had a client tell me that he w was so sick of being told no mm -hmm. that he just stopped identifying as a veteran because he just figured that he didn't qualify. He said, if I, you know, I just assumed that any building with a flag out front, I wasn't allowed to go into. And he served in the Gulf War. He was a very, you know, I mean, he was deployed and, mm -hmm. uh, but he had a, you know, bad ending. And unfortunately, people think that that just means that they don't, they're no longer entitled to that, to that, you know, title and it's mm -hmm. just not true right. um, and like like he said there's there's plenty of organizations like mine that that will you know work with you regardless of your discharge um, it's just about the the government funding and even then there are options to upgrade um, and things like that but I think changing the language and making it known that it's not you're not asking in order to penalize you're asking in order to help and and that's really important. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've been trying to do as an organization is to close some of the loopholes because some of like a center that works exclusively with veterans, for example, might not understand all of the challenges that the veteran has with respect to their criminal justice involvement. Right. right. So if I'm referring someone out for a job, it's like I might not say what you said that, you know, you don't have the conversation with the employees. You send the person for the job, the vet or the person with military experience thinks that he or she is eligible, but it's like, well, no, you have criminal justice involvement. So right. what, what were you doing when you were working directly with veterans to be able to ensure that if they go to a job or if they go for housing, that the landlord or the company understands that the person is, has military experience, but the person might also have criminal justice right. system involvement? Okay, what Paul's about myself doing and what it, it determines 
they have a, a relationship with the employers. Yes. And that's basically what I was doing. My job was basically to go out into the community, knock on doors, go to different organizations, establish uh, community-based partnerships, mm. and pretty much speak on behalf, not only speak on behalf of the veteran, but follow up with the veteran to let it be known that if there's any issue that you need, you can come see me. You know, you don't have to go to the veteran itself. Come and see me. I will go to the veteran, address the issue, find out what the issue really was, and then take it back to the employer. You yeah. know, so I think it's more going back to the fact that it's more veterans need to be working with the organizations and within the VA. Yeah. And what about, I mean, you have some experiences. Do you think that they are instructive for the audience with respect to you looking for employment or with respect to you looking for housing? Is there something that you did that you think there's a tremendous amount of overlap with other veterans? Like, how were you successful in navigating the process after serving an extensive amount of time? I think because I stayed involved. Okay. And like I said, when I was in, even in prison in 1984, I was working with veterans, and I just stayed involved with the whole veterans community all the way up through. Even when I came home in 2009, they brought me straight to the VA up in Montrose. And other veterans reached out for me. But well, why? Why stay connected? Because there are benefits there for you. Mm -hmm. There are things that people, other veterans who know what they're doing and can guide you. A lot of times our best thinking get us where we're at and we don't let anyone else try to guide us out of it. But if you got another vet that you're talking to and they're sitting there talking and they talk to you more direct. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. she speaks as a clinician, so she had to speak in a certain terminology. Mm -hmm. I could look at her and say, yo, man, shut up and listen to what I'm telling you. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't been there where you've been at. Stop and listen. Mm -hmm. You know, and that tend to get the attention. Mm -hmm. But if you're speaking as a clinician and you can't say those type of things and you've been nice and humble, then they're going to try to manipulate that. Mm -hmm. Going to where they think they need to be. Mm -hmm. And what, like I said before, their best thinking got you where you're at. Mm -hmm. You need to have other people. Let somebody else, get, get out your own head, let somebody else guide you. Yeah. You know? yeah and I was talking about uh, that the council was coordinating a committee to try to understand the issues of veterans. But I mentioned to you that I don't know if there was someone that had right. uh, military experience and or criminal justice involvement included. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is, do you, how important do you think it is to have someone who's directly affected? Oh, profoundly important. I mean, I think that's something that, that the most successful clinicians are able to uh, admit to their limitations and, mm -hmm. and providers in general, you know, and, and recognize that you have an experience that I do not. And it's, yes. uh, you know, and I, you're here to teach me just as much as I'm here to help you and and I think that uh, you know to have just a, a no matter how educated or, or well versed you are in the topic it you can always be benefited by having somebody that's actually been there and experienced it mm -hmm. um, to, to provide some insight and guidance as well Got it. and is the VA open now to hiring people that have prior criminal justice system yes involvement? I mean as far as I'm understanding the VA has long time you know uh, experience with hiring formerly incarcerated they may not start off in a clinician perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, they usually start off in uh, housekeeping or kitchen, and from there they can maneuver through the system. Yeah. But yes, they, they will not. Only thing that would uh, from a from a formerly incarcerated veteran come in and does the application, go through the USA job thing, and then when he gets called and he lies and said he wasn't incarcerated, they'll get rid of you for lying, but they won't get rid of you for being incarcerated. Now right. there are some restrictions on that. I think, I think my own experience that uh, substance abuse, not substance abuse. Uh, molestation, um, rape cases, mm -hmm. they, they're not too tolerable with that. Yeah, so there are some charges that the VA, and I mean, in a lot of the organizations right. it's have society a lot in of itself. restrictions. Yeah, yeah it's, for us as an agency, we're trying to, of course, deal with this issue of the stigma of criminal justice system involvement mm -hmm. and, you know, trying to ban the box in different, you know, housing applications, employment, and so forth. So as we move towards ending the show, what do you, again, what do you recommend for service providers and others to, to be able to better work with people who have um, military experience and criminal justice system involvement? I think just be open to the, you know, opportunities for learning and, and expanding, you know, your, your knowledge base on the topic to, to, you know, jump at any opportunity to speak to a veteran, to speak yes. to somebody that's been incarcerated, a veteran that's been incarcerated yeah. and hear their experience and, and you know, be able to, to really learn from that, that discussion with them. Mm -hmm. um, and just the more, I think, the community 
understands because it's really not discussed enough in, in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. The more the community providers understand, the better they'll be to help. Yeah. And what about you, Lynn? How, as we I concur with everything that you just said. I, I mean, you said it much better than I could, yeah. and I think you're right. We need to have a, a unity of work, you know, not mm -hmm. just the clinicians, but the people working under the clinicians, and, and the payments got to be better, too. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, somebody coming off, like, for example, you're working in a higher office as a non-clinician, and you may be up to, like, say, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year, mm -hmm. but then when you come down to the community-based organizations who may not have that type of funding, you know, how do you bridge that? Right. Yeah, I mean, again, for us, it, it's about trying to, you know, address some of the, you know, systemic barriers that folks that have criminal justice system involvement have faced. And f we don't pretend to be an agency that has large expertise right. working with veterans. Mm -hmm. But as you just noted, we're learning a lot from mm -hmm. talking to veterans. We're learning a lot from, from collaborating with other service providers and not just the, who are offering services, but the advocacy that needs to be done. It needs to include, as you both noted, the veterans. Because exactly. you can't, I mean, I don't know how encouraging it is to say that you're doing something for veterans without including them in the process. Absolutely. You can't. Yeah. You know, and you have to be veteran-centered. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like I tell people right away, I don't know what your problem is. I don't know what your answer is. Yeah. But I can help shift some of the clouds out your way so you can find it for yourself. You know, yeah. rather than us taking a top-down approach, that I know more about what you're doing and just shut up. You know what I'm saying? Even I use that terminology, but it still has to be geared toward what the veteran wants. Exactly. At least make an effort. Exactly. Well, thank you both for this really intelligent conversation. I believe that our audience was enlightened by what you all talked about. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, so thank you, much. Lynn, for being thank with us on both sides me, of the yes. bars. Thank you. So thank you. Sarah and Lynn for joining us on both sides of the bars today. And thank you in TV land for joining us as well. If you're interested in finding out more about the Fortune Society, please check us out on the web at fortunesociety.org or on Facebook by typing in the Fortune Society. This is Ronald Day as we critically look at both sides of the bars.